Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of The Best Practices Show. You ever thought about your hygiene equation? Is my hygiene department profitable? Is it optimized? I feel like there's a lot of cancellations. How do I get everyone together on the same page and make this really work? Whether I have one hygienist or a hundred hygienists. Well, today we're going to help you with that. Today, I'm going to share a recent webinar we did with two amazing coaches, Miranda Beeson and Courtney Dalton. And we take you through the profitable hygiene equation, how to optimize the workflow you have for success. It's awesome. You're going to listen to this webinar. You'll also see that we're going to include the links to the webinar so that you can watch it with your team. I would highly encourage you to have a team meeting and just watch the webinar together and all the resources and everything you need to be successful. We're here to help you every step of the way. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode and we'll see you soon. Should we talk hygiene? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do I'm it. Share my screen. Awesome. I'm excited. So clearly a lot of admin when we're on ACT events, but I am a hygienist and I'm so excited to share with a fellow hygienist and coach Courtney today. As we co-host and talk about the profitable hygiene equation and how to optimize workflow and efficiencies and services for success in your day-to-day. -day. So we're going to jump right in. And before we really get into the content, we want to make sure that we invite you to join us in our To The Top Study Club in Milwaukee. And we were just chatting before the webinar got going on. We have our second session for quarter one tomorrow, and we're having a little FOMO because we went to the first session. So Kirk, like build a little enthusiasm and engagement for the community that's on today about what happens at To The Top and why you love it so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you for asking. So uh, if you're listening to this, here's the deal. Um, we had this vision a long time ago to create a study club, a study club of leaders that could grow other leaders, uh, people that could learn a lot collectively from other practice owners in the pro coaching and act dental community. And it started real small. Our goal was to get like, let's see if we can get 30 people to come regularly. It's grown so beautifully now. We have two groups. Last week, we had a group of 53, and we have a group of 47 coming in. And our vision ultimately is like, I don't want to have like 7,000 people. That's not my goal. But our goal is to have three groups of 50 working together. And the cool thing about it is it's every quarter. It's the same content. It is a ton of content. It's almost 70 pages. It's going to take me four days to get through all of it. <laughs> but it's the best stuff you'll find anywhere in how to run a dental practice. And the cool thing about having three sessions every quarter is that when life gets in the way, you can jump from one session to the next and you have a collective group of people that are there to have your back. Dentistry is very lonely. It's very hard to run your own business and try to figure that out. Don't. I love it because I get to learn so much every Friday. I'm a geek about CE. <laughs> And it's the best CE ever because it's not coming from me. You know, it's like coming from the room and people go, I do this. I do that. I think differently about it. And when you leave, just think about it. It's one day every 90 days where you go and you rethink how you lead, how you build your, whatever you're building. And you go, I feel really well supported. It's from eight to three. The cool thing about the golden ticket is we believe in it so much. Here's my challenge. Come. Come for free as our guest. And if you hate it, take all the material, steal it, use it, and we'll high five each other. And you'll, and just tell me this sucked, but you won't say that. Do you know what I mean? Like you'll go, I, I just believe in it so much. You can come kick the tires for free. And what you have to do is if you registered for this webinar, you get a golden ticket, 
You have to follow the process and Gina will arrange that for you. She's like our personal concierge and therapist around here for people. And she <laughs> will make sure that we take great care of you. And so please join us at one of the coolest things you'll ever find in dentistry. I love that. And just so everyone knows, I, I think we have doctors and probably hygienists on today. And so that is a doctor only event, but I want to share another thing that we offer, which is our BPA, the best practices association. So one of the things that's so awesome about to the top and being in the room is the community, uh, the people that are there, the stories that they're sharing. And so we have transitioned that and we're opening a virtual world for that same type of community to build for CE geek loving dental tooth nerd people <laughs> like us to unite and be in one space where we can all share our stories and learn from one another. And so through the BPA, we have a mobile app. And you can get notifications. You can make sure that if one of you know you get tagged or something pops up that you're interested in learning about a new event, uh, it'll pop right up on your phone. And so with that BPA, uh, we have a QR code here for you. It's pretty new to us. We're revamping what we're doing here with our community online. And so we'd love for you to scan the QR code, come check out what the BPA has to offer and see if it's something that you might be interested in coming and hanging out with us on a regular basis online. Yeah. And One more thing I'll just add, and I, I know we got a lot to cover today. What we're building is best practices. It's all the stuff that we do, the coolest stuff that we find, tools, all of it, all the videos. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of videos. We put it into an app. It's easy to access. And my favorite thing is now people in the BPA are asking questions like, how do you handle this? How do you handle that? And you have everybody chiming in, not only from the coaching team here, but you've got the collective community going, I wouldn't do that. And me. <laughs> so, um, so it's a lot of fun. It's $99 a month. It's everything that we we gather that we consider the best stuff out there. Um, and you can use it right at your fingertips. I promise you it will make your life better and your practice better. So join us, follow the QR code. Uh, you won't regret it. Awesome. And one last opportunity that speaks right to the hygienist is going to be Katrina Sanders in our hygiene course that's coming up. So uh, if you aren't a practice owner or a leader that will be joining us for a To the Top Study Club event, we do have Katrina Sanders coming live to our learning center in Milwaukee in March, and she'll be back again in the fall. And so if you haven't ever seen Katrina Sanders speak, like you're in for a treat, you should check her out because if you want to talk dental nerd passion for perio <laughs> it's katrina so all day and all day long <laughs> <laughs> i learned from her i absolutely love her so this is an opportunity that's unique to hygienists but we do welcome teams and doctors to come as well so awesome someone awesome. raised their hand kirk i don't know if we want to address it right off the jump before we get started wait 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 be patient with me somebody who <laughs> I don't see it in the chat. Oh, wait, wait. My sound is echoing. Is that happening to anyone else? So they might, be, they might just be going like, yeah, I want to be there, you know? <laughs> All right. I'm going to keep rolling. You stop me if there's a good question. You keep going. To touch. Okay. So let's get going with how are we going to build a profitable hygiene equation in the office? How do we optimize our workflow for success day to day? So Courtney and I are going to jump in. And the most important thing that we always start with when we have a webinar or anything really is just why. Why is this important? So this is our slow go for a uh, slow go. Slogan logo, I made a new word for the quarter, which is time is the new rich. And time is a hot commodity in the hygiene world. Courtney, would you not agree? A million percent. It's the number one complaint that we hear that I just don't have enough time, not even from just hygienists, but from our clients too. Yeah. And when we used to sit chair side, that 60 minutes, which we all know, you know, we're going to talk about 60 minutes today as an average appointment time. And I know not everyone has a 60 minute workflow. So we're going to speak to the 60 minute workflow today because I would say that's probably the most average time frame that hygienists have. And um, that's what we lived, Courtney and I, when we lived our life as hygienists clinically. And that time just flies by. You think to yourself like an hour is forever, but no, there's so much to accomplish during that time. And we really have to make the most of that hour. And the bottom line is like cutting corners isn't an option. So we have to find ways to be able to build relationships, continue to have that top shelf level of care and not cut corners within this hour and still make sure that we're 
getting everything accomplished. And we're going to talk a little bit about the laundry list of things that we have to do in that hygiene hour. We're sitting down. We're ready for the list. (laughs) Everybody take a breath, right? (laughs) So it is possible. And we're going to help you look at some strategies for how are we going to be able to tackle all of these things, not cut corners and keep building relationships and having that strong relationship uh, side chair side with our patients. Um, so do you want to jump in the course, Courtney, or do you want me to take this one on? Uh, you take this one on. All I'll right. No in problem. Here a <laughs> so looking at the journal of dental hygiene from August of 2020, they did some polling. Um, as we know, hygiene around the COVID era, right after COVID things have changed a lot. And so we started looking into the brains of hygienists and trying to say like, where's everybody going? Why, why have they left? How can we get them back? What are the things that matter to a hygienist? And so the number one thing that was reported in this particular poll was just not enough time in the work schedule. And as a result of that, the second and third leading options, aside from the neediness of patients, we're going to leave that. I don't one think we another, can control that. We're going to leave that for another <laughs> webinar. Someone else can handle that one. <laughs> it's just the difficulty in main, maintaining work-life balance. We have been talking about burnout a lot since that COVID era uh, in every profession, but certainly in dentistry. And when we look at work-life balance, not having enough time in our schedule or feeling like we're impacted by the clock does impact our work-life happiness and that balance and that burnout factor in the office. And physical pain. Ergonomics is a big topic in the world of hygiene. Uh, Ergonomics and a a physical repetitive stress injury is what took me out of clinical hygiene. So this one hits home for me. We put our bodies through a lot as hygienists. And when we don't have the structure and the efficiency within our workday and we don't have enough time within our schedule and we don't use that time well that physical pain is going to impact us to a greater degree as well. So we're really, when we look at these triggers for the hygienists, most of them really do come back to the time that we have built in to caring for our patients. So here's that list. Everybody hold hold your breath. (laughs) There's a lot of things that happen in a hygiene visit. And everyone that's on right now, if you're a hygienist, you're probably thinking of multiple things that I don't even have on the list. So when we go through this hour and we think about, you know, a lot of times we'll hear people say like, how is it? They have an hour. How is it not enough? Why is everybody still running behind? There's a lot. There's a lot that happens during that hour. And so if we can take some level of control over all of these things that happen and systemize things to the best of our ability, we can make that hour function in a much more efficient way. So that's what we're going to dig into today. So how do we do it? Well, we're going to help you out. We're going to share that with you. (laughs) There's basically three segments to a hygiene appointment. And I like to break them up into diagnostic, therapeutic, and logistic. So when we look at these three different segments, they can be broken up pretty evenly throughout the appointment. And I have to shout out Rachel Wall because... Many, many years ago, I transitioned to an office that I was the only hygienist in this practice, and I had to basically create a a hygiene program and department. And I went to Rachel Wall at the time for a little bit of help, and I learned the 2020-20 concept of how do I take this hour and break it into these three 20-minute segments and get a little more control over all of the things that have to happen in this hour long visit. Courtney, did you utilize the 2020 when you were in private practice? Absolutely. And it gives it such a strong framework and rules to follow. What should I do in this first 20? What, what does diagnostic, you know, off that off your list, what is all considered diagnostic? What's considered therapeutic and where does it go? And then what do I do if I go over that time? It just gives your diagnosis as a hygienist, so much more perspective when you can break it down and give it some, some boundaries. Yeah. There's something to be said about kind of controlling the chaos of what happens during that hour. And yeah. so when you can stop and put it into these little segments, it does really start to help. So I'm excited to challenge your thinking if you haven't tried this before, and we're going to go through what each of these segments are, uh, what's comprised within each of the segments. And then what are some strategies for efficiency within each one as well? All right. So the first segment is that diagnostic segment. And I would say that the most things are comprised within this segment. So this is the part of the appointment where all of the diagnostic data is collected. So we're looking at personal data. 
just greeting your patient and learning a little bit more about them and what they have going on today. And we'll go into a little more detail here. We're gathering their systemic health data. We know how important the whole body connection is with oral health. And so we do, and and actually in the past probably decade to a decade and a half, we've done even more and more in this. We're getting much more in depth into our health history reviews and um, salivary studies and A1C counts and things that maybe years ago we didn't even ask. Um, tooth health data. We're needing to look at what's going on in the mouth. Do the margin? Are there any open margins around the crowns? Are there any cavities that we're seeing that we want to alert our provider to? So we're looking at tooth health data, and we're also, of course, gathering periodontal health data, and that can be very time consuming as well. So we want to look at what are some things that we can do to strategize improving the efficiency around all of this data collection. So again, here's the list. These are the things that primarily fall within the diagnostic category. So we're greeting our patient. We're doing a med history review. Most of us are checking blood pressure or would like to, but we feel like we don't have the time. (laughs) Discussing chief concerns. We're taking radiographs. We're doing imaging, extra oral imaging, intraoral imaging, scans. A lot of offices have hygiene teams doing intraoral scans now with their patients caries assessment, oral cancer screening, occlusion screening, cursory dental exam, it goes on and on and on. And so all of these things, uh, we're going to talk about strategies to make things more efficient. We don't have to do all of it every single time. So that's part of it. And then the key here is once we have finished this first 20 minutes, or we've collected the above data that we plan to collect for the day, let's call for our exam. So that's really step one in a strategy for efficiency is at the end of this diagnostic section or segment of the appointment, go ahead and let the doctor know, like, I have all the information I could need. Come on in. Courtney, did you ever mind if a doctor interrupted you to do an exam? Never, never. And it was such a blessing, right? Because now I'm not pacing back and forth. I'm not sweating because my next patient's here. And also, Can we just validate our hygienist for a minute? This is a lot. This is only the first 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we know that you have a lot to gather. And this is this is such a great list, Miranda. It really is. And we do all of this day after day. Not even day after day, hour after hour. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love that you said let's stop and validate. Yes, pat yourself on the back. Like give each other a virtual high five because it's a lot. It's not, it's and and it takes a lot of mind capacity and a lot of brain power to make it happen. And I laugh picturing you pacing outside the op because I'm sure that everyone who's on the webinar, I used to, we wore headsets in one of the offices that I worked in and Sometimes I'd request an exam a couple of times and then I'd, you guys would laugh. I'd get on and I'd say, you know, I've been waiting for a doctor check <laughs> coming to, like you gotta have some fun with it, but we all have been there for sure. <laughs> My pacing just got louder and heavier and quicker. <laughs> Stomping your feet. <laughs> I just got our next video idea for Andy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Andy, let's do it. <laughs> I still have my dance goes. I can find oh, them. Yeah. <laughs> Stomping in your dance goes. <laughs> All right. So the first strategy to help this segment of the appointment be more efficient is just preparation, 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 preparation. You know, the more prepared we are, the more successful that flow will be in the first 20 minutes. So one thing in particular is chart prep. And I can't express enough how important taking a look, I like to say the day prior and being prepared for the day to come the next day. And then having that information at Huddle. Do you want to speak to Huddle and the value of Huddle, Courtney? Uh, sure. I I love, Miranda, I love that you said I like to collect this the day before. I do also. It's, it's one of those tasks that we add to the end of the day checklist so that you can come in a few minutes prior to when your Huddle starts turn your op on, get the sterilization area rolling, do the things you need to do to prep your room and then be present for huddle. So you're bringing all this valuable information with you. Is there unscheduled treatment? Are there perio concerns? Did they have a specialist um, visit sometime in between now and the last visit? And these are things that you want to bring to the doctor's attention so that your day just flows as smoothly as possible. 
Yeah. And like, who needs x-rays today? Who do I need a full mouth perio chart on? And maybe I'm going to need an assistant if they're available to come help me document that if I don't have voice recorded software. So the more that you're prepared the day prior for what's to come and then sharing that amongst the entire team at morning huddle, the more efficient your day will flow. Mm -hmm. We also can then make sure that we have our equipment prepared. You know, if I know, like we've done our chart prep, I know I have three patients who need a full mouth series of x-rays tomorrow. I'm going to make sure that I have uh, a sensor prepared and ready. If we, you know, if you have a nomad and you need to make sure that's near or at your room, you can talk about that at huddle too. What if you're sharing one nomad amongst, you know, three hygienists or five team members, you can work out the kinks of how you might get tripped up with your radiographs. If you're all fighting over the nomad, there's another video, (laughs) everyone fighting over the nomad in the hallway. I love Um, it. Having your RIN in your room laid out and ready to go. You know, if you're taking photos, do you have your mirror? Do you have your camera? And just being as prepared as possible with your equipment rather than having to leave the room multiple times throughout the appointment, because that does take time and decreases our efficiency. Same thing with our room inventory and stocking. Taking a look, again, at part of your checklist, either in the morning or in the afternoon, or maybe it's your midday checklist of like, let me look at my drawers. Let me make sure I have everything that I need. If I know I'm doing sealants the next day because of my chart prep, do I have sealant material here in my op? Do I have the dry angles? Do I have everything that I'm going to need? And just making sure that you keep a nice, consistent inventory in your operatory so that, again, you're not having to come and go and come and go because that can break up the appointment and you can reduce some of that efficiency. And then the other thing to think about is that giant list. Again, we don't have to do all of those things every single time. Now, a new patient visit is going to be quite different. And oftentimes an office does have additional time worked into the schedule, or you might have 60 minutes, but you also have 30 or 60 minutes carved out with your doctor for part of this. So we're really speaking more to the periodontal maintenance, the profi recare visit during this webinar, when we're talking about this 2020 So you may be updating your x-rays this visit, and the next time the patient comes in, I'm going to do that full periodontal recording. Now, I would still say for your periodontal maintenance patients, we still want to spot probe. We want to be checking each time they come in. Yes. But if if we took um, extra oral photos today with our 35 millimeter camera, so next time we're taking intraoral oral photos maybe just a couple of them to touch up and see comparison. So you don't have to do all of these things each time. And in your preparation, what did I do last time? Oh, I did some intraoral photos last time. So what am I going to do this time as opposed? So we're not having to feel backlogged by catching up on everything all at once. Absolutely. You got more to add? No, I was just going to, (laughs) no. I saw your brilliant (laughs) wheels turning. Feel free to step in whenever. (laughs) Well, the second strategy is setting clear connection time expectations. And I don't know about you, Courtney, but this is one that comes up a lot, or I see it when I'm observing in offices and, um, when you're chatting with the patient and you know, that patient's coming in and they're going to want to catch up. And so many of our patients just, they just want someone to hang out with. (laughs) And we become therapists and we look forward to that, right? Which is great. And there's a time to efficiently have that conversation. Yes. And, and I think part of going into dental hygiene, most of us in dental hygiene have, we talk about disc a lot. We have that S or I personality style where we do like people and we want to have connections. And so it's really easy to get lost in that, but like chatty patients, no problem. We have a couple of strategies that can help you out. The first one is you want to give time expectations for catching up at the start of the appointment, especially if it's a patient that, you know, is chatty someone that you love, like we could go have coffee, honestly, like, do we need to do this right now? So those are the people that you, when they come in, you want to say, you know what? I can't wait to hear about your son's wedding. I'm sure it was fabulous. I have five minutes for us to just chat and then we have to get rolling, but like, oh gosh, do you have pictures? Tell me what's going on. And you set that time parameter so that at the end of five minutes, you can say, oh gosh, our five minute catch up time is up. But I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and get started on your radiographs today. And you can keep filling me in as we go. We'll have a couple of little breaks here and there. And then you can get rolling with your appointment. The other thing to think about is, um, you. well, this is what I was mentioning, continuing to guide that conversation during the data collection phase, the other tip and Courtney and I were chatting about this webinar and we both did the same thing as hygienists. When you had that patient that loves to chat, as soon as you know, you have to leave their mouth. Like here's a little tidbit for you. 
just start telling a story. Like if you have to turn around to like get another piece of equipment or change instruments and you know, you know, those people that immediately start talking the second your hands aren't in their mouth, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I started a new series on Netflix. It's called such and such. And I'm just (laughs) talking away while I'm getting the next thing ready. And then what did they do? They just listen and they don't fill the space. (laughs) Which is great, right? And I think sometimes we don't think about what we can do. Sometimes our our brain goes to, well, I'm going to add on 15 minutes to this appointment because this patient's chatty. When actually that's crushing our schedule. That's not making us efficient. That's decreasing our overall ability to see and take care of our patients when there's a better solution. What a great solution. I love it. Yeah. We just have to know. Oh, and hey, doctor, when you come in today, I know I tell you to ask open-ended questions all the time, but (laughs) this is an exception. (laughs) No open-ended questions. Yes or no's only. (laughs) All right. We also want to utilize technology to our advantage. So we want to ensure that our cameras and scanners and equipment are up to date. They're integrated with our software. If there's calibration that needs to be done, we have a systematic approach to making sure that we're calibrating our equipment and using that technology day in and day out. Our practice management software is just PMS. That's what that stands for. So your Dentrix, your EagleSoft, your Open Dental, your Curve, most of them have templates for recording chart information. So if you have a predetermined auto template set up for the health history and the systemic health data collection, it helps to make your note taking more efficient throughout the appointment because you can in that moment, just check the box, fill in the gap, check the box, fill in the gap. And it leaves you from sitting at the end of the day, having 20 minutes of paragraph that we have to write out about what we talked about and what data we gathered during that part of the appointment. We can also use voice recorded or assisted perio charting. This is something that some people absolutely love and other people feel like it slows them down a little bit if you have a good flow for your charting. But when you are having to chart vacation involvement, separation, recession, bleeding points, like if it's more than just the pocket depth, it can be really helpful to have either voice recorded, or in some offices, you can have an assistant that again, at the morning huddle knows I have a challenging perio patient today. I'm going to need some help recording my perio chart. And that can help to make that time frame more efficient when we're gathering that periodontal data. Did you ever use voice recorded, Courtney? I didn't even ask you. I did not, but I was going to interject here and say, just as a side note, if you are not saying your numbers out loud, even if you're the only person in the room that's recording them, if you are not saying your numbers out loud so your patient can hear you, you are missing out on a huge open door to the periodontal health conversation. Oh, that is such a, such a good point. One of my favorite things to tell a patient is, you know, we're going to be doing your periodontal evaluation now. What that means is we're checking the health of your gums and your bone. And I would like you to be a part of this. So I'm going to be calling out some numbers and they mean this. So your job while I'm doing this is to listen at the numbers that I'm saying out loud. And you have one other job and that is to feel for anything that's tender or uncomfortable. Because if something's tender or uncomfortable, that means there's infection more than likely. So two jobs for you while we're doing this, listen for the numbers and feel for any discomfort because otherwise they're just laying there thinking like, she's stabbing me. This is the pokey part. This is where, this is is why nobody likes us (laughs) because we poke them. (laughs) This is the pokey part. Of course, my gums are going to bleed. You're stabbing me. You just stabbed me. (laughs) Well, here's why. Here's what it all means. Kirk, you're getting insight into what we hear (laughs) as hygienists. So excited. (laughs) So the other thing is, uh, from a technology standpoint, setting up efficient perio charting flow. So each practice management software, you can also set up the flow in which you want to record that data. So I have my own flow. I always started in the upper right on the buckle Mm -hmm. and worked my way around and came from the lingual, right? And so everyone has a flow that they feel more efficient in charting. And so set up your software to mimic that flow. And that's going to help for you to have a good rhythm when you're documenting those periodontal data numbers. The next thing around the diagnostic segment is intentional patient communication. So what teams will often share, what things that we observe, and and I've observed it my own self and really struggled with this early on in my hygiene career in the first probably five or six years was I have so much information that I have to share with this patient. 
And then that can take so much time. But if we're really intentional about the way we communicate with our patients, we can trim that time down and still get our message across. And I would actually argue that the message would be received even better than that information dump. So I would like to just put out their co-discovery. I know some people have heard of this before and some people haven't, but basically this just means learning together with your patient. So the co-discovery process is sharing what you're doing as you go. We just gave an example of that when we were talking about, listen for this, feel for that. I'm going to be doing this. If you do that before you even start period charting, when they sit back up and that assessment is over, you don't have to go into this giant long spiel and try to get their engagement when they they're diagnose like, themselves. They're still, they're diagnose themselves. <laughs> All you have to say is, you know, you were listening for this and you were feeling for that. Tell me your thoughts on what you heard and what you felt. And they're already putting themselves into that co-discovery diagnosis process because they were a part of it from the beginning. Yeah. I we think, had a comment. I'm going to share this. Oh, yeah. Somebody put in the chat. It's great when those numbers, when those patients know the meaning of those numbers, they are often aghast. Absolutely. And How if often you, do you start and then not tell them, this is what I'm doing? So, you know... One, three, three, two, three, three, two, three, seven, three, you know, these are numbers. And if you don't tell them what they mean, they're not along for the ride. So then when you tell them why they have periodontal disease and what you can do to help them control it, it, it doesn't resound as well as it could had you brought them along on the journey with you. Yeah. When you ask them, you know, what, what concerns you about what you heard or what you felt, they're going to say, well, I mean, it was definitely uncomfortable, mostly in the back. It didn't bother me so much in the front. Okay. Well, remember we talked about if it's uncomfortable, there may be some infection. So I'm going to take a look. And is it okay if I see that to share that with you? Like, let's look at it together with, with a mirror. Let's look at your image. What about those numbers? Well, you said, you know, fours, five, sixes. And I did hear that a couple of times. Like, am I losing my bone? Like now they're engaged. They're interested because they've been a part of that process. And we don't have to fight as hard or for as long to get them to come along on that journey with us. Absolutely. The other thing that I think works really, really well for that is using imaging to speak for us. So intraoral photos are amazing. Um, really orienting your patient to their x-rays is great. Like here, hey, I'm going to pull up your x-rays. And what does everybody say that x-rays look like? Toes. Toes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I heard the chat just shout that out loud. <laughs> so, like so many patients just see toes. So they don't know what we're pointing at and what we're talking about. So if we can orient them, like I'm going to be taking a look at your x-rays. These white areas here are healthy. If there's a gray spot in this white area, that's something I'm going to stop and talk to you about. Here's your bone. Like let them know what it is that you're looking at. They're not going to become, you know, a hygienist overnight because of your brief introduction, but they're going to be more engaged as you're looking through those x-rays. I'm going to jump ahead two slides because I want to mention um, Pearl and we, we are success partners with Pearl, but I wish I had Pearl when I was a private practice clinician because this AI integration and the ability to, they're actually prepared. They have a FDA clearance to have this patient facing. So you can actually overlay the AI onto the radiographs and it helps to show the patient the things that you're seeing. And it becomes less like I'm the bad guy or like they have to trust me. And here it is clear in color exactly what's happening in the patient's mouth. And so then they're more, again, an active participant. They're going to see these little pink dots and they're like, what are, what are the little pink dots? Well, those are areas that they're thinking might be decay. Let's pull that back off and look at it together. Okay, let's put it back on. And they're moving along on that journey with you. So again, just taking advantage of technology and the way that we communicate it. Um, communicating in the patient's style is huge. If you're a C-style person and your general method of communication is to give a lot of detail and information because you need that to make a decision, not everyone does. So you could be wasting tons of time during your appointment if you have maybe a D-style patient in the chair or an I-style patient in the chair. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look up DISC or uh, hop back. I'm sure we have it within the BPA on several videos <laughs> and things. We talk about it all the time, but it's four behavioral styles, communication styles, and D style people and I style people tend to be a bit more urgent in their decision-making. They really don't need as much information. 
And so if you're spending a ton of time going over statistical analysis and success rates and research papers and giving them literature, they could have already been on board like 15 minutes ago and didn't even need that information. Now, mind you, if you're a D-style person, you're going to have to slow down and make sure if you have a C in your chair that you give them a little bit of that information. Right, Courtney? I was just going to tell you that. What about the other way for those of us who are Cs and those of us who are Ds? <laughs> but but you do have to read your patient. And I love imaging. I love leaving x-rays on the screen. I love leaving a great intraoral photo, like a ledge on the lower interior of calculus or a fractured tooth or a broken, um, you know, old amalgam or something. And then they can see it for themselves after you've reviewed it with them, right? In their style. Because even I think across any style, you could just have the picture up and let the patient tell you what they see. And just by that dialogue, and again, if this is a patient you've seen for a long time, you you know their preferences. You can you can feel them out pretty pretty well, but you can have that conversation, let them drive it in their style while they are buying in because they're finding all of this information about themselves with you at the same time. And what you just said is, I'm the same. I love just having an image up. When we do that chart prep, if I know last time they were here, we talked about a crown on number three because there was an older amalgam, there was fracture lines. I'm going to have that image up. As soon as they come in the operatory, it's just already there, ready to go. I don't have to say a word. They're going to ask me, is that my tooth? And then this last tip we have here about asking open-ended questions, then all you have to say is like, that is your tooth. What concerns you about that? And just let that open-ended question land and give them the space to tell you if they're concerned about or not, what questions they have. Mm -hmm. And now, again, you're not having to force that information upon them. They're asking for it and giving you the permission. Look at Kirk. You're just raising his hand. hand. (laughs) I'm raising. I love when people chime in. So keep chiming in. Amanda Hill just said, my husband recently got a treatment plan from a C-style dentist, and it was so much information that he ended up refusing treatment because he was annoyed. Oh. Whoa. That would be me. Wow. I would do that. <laughs> that would be you. And I would be like, well, I don't understand. I gave them everything I could. <laughs> what could I have done differently? <laughs> it totally happens. I, but it's and, right. That's yeah, totally I right. told a story one time I about a D-style dentist that I know and my friend's mom. and. Like the, he thought for sure that she was going to move forward with this like full arch of treatment. And she had called me that night, like in tears, like I just had to leave as fast as possible. What do I do? I signed up for a consult, but I'm not doing that. (laughs) But she was like an S style person who just doesn't like to rock the boat and doesn't want to cause conflict. And so she was just going along with it. And that D was just forging ahead. Like, yeah, she's on board. Let's do it. And again, we have to stop every now and then and just check in. Are you with me? How are you doing? How are we I'm, doing? I'm going to be super vulnerable. This is a long time ago. I actually fell asleep in a chair when a hygienist just kept talking. I was like, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just fell asleep when she was talking. She wasn't, it was like, I was waiting. It was like five minutes of like, so it was be, a monologue. It was. Yeah. So be, be very aware. Yeah. Of how engaged and these, these personality styles are important. They're very important. Yeah. I always say patients are just, they're not information receptacles. Like, and, and that was a mistake, like vulnerable, vulnerable moment as a young hygienist. That was a mistake that I made. I came out of hygiene school. Like I, at like top of my class, I know what I need to teach people. Like I've got all this education, let's go. And like, people didn't want to hear it the way mm-hmm. The way that I thought they would. And then I felt like no one listens and you get a little beat down as a hygienist and you start to feel like, what am I even doing? Like no one even does what I ask them to do. I want it more than my patients. But if we just stop for a minute and shift the way that we're presenting that information, not only we're going to get back on track, does it make things more efficient within that 20 minute segment? Um, it also does help to fulfill you as a provider because you start to see change in people and you start to see them owning their own disease. And it just really does like shift that mindset of beating your head against the wall day after day and not getting anywhere. But maybe if you are doing that, maybe it's time to ask yourself, am I meeting my patients where they are? Is there a tweak I can make? And the tweaks are within the content today. So perfect timing. Love it. All right, co-discovery tools, intraoral photography, extraoral photography. We talked about the perio chart and like periodontal graphics and having your patient be an active participant and knowing what's happening before we just start doing those things. 
Disclosing solution is awesome. And I know sometimes I rub hygienists the wrong way when I say that, because again, we don't have time for that. But I would argue that disclosing your patient actually saves a ton of time when it comes to OHI and your actual instrumentation and debridement, because you can see what you're working with. It's just right there. Um, Mirrors, digital scanners, and obviously your radiographs. Using all of these tools to learn with your patient. And it's going to be less of that monologue time that we have to build in to that co, um, not co-discovery diagnostic segment of the appointment. Cool. Absolutely. So I think that moves us right into, um, oh, the 75, 25 rule. Courtney and I were talking and she's like, what is this? I said, this is my rule. It's not the 75, 25 rule. This is Miranda's 75, 25 rule. So hygienists don't panic. I didn't know this either until Miranda said it. <laughs> I love it. So for me, I think 75% of the appointment should be health conversation. And 25% of the appointment is that personal connection and relationship building. And what I have noticed in my own personal experience early on in working with other hygienists and now as a coach is a lot of the times when we're running behind, we're skewing this statistic a little bit. And we're having a lot of personal conversation throughout the appointment that then makes us rush through having to get into the health-centered conversation. So I just like to say, if you have in your mindset about 75% clinical health-centered conversation, 25% personal relationship building, and if that swaps, that's when we start to lose some of our value as hygienists. And we're not healthcare providers to those people so much anymore. It's more like that nail salon visit or that hair visit Mm -hmm. where you're kind of chatting and getting a service done versus we really want them to see us as oral health therapists. We're healthcare providers. And so we have to speak healthcare language the bulk of our appointment time. Okay. The therapeutic segment. So um, this segment of the appointment is where the therapeutic or the cleaning services happen. (laughs) So when we're looking at that, this is our working segment. I like to say this is minimal communication and conversation during this middle 20 minutes because we're getting down to business. Doesn't mean you're not going to speak at all during the middle 20 minutes of your appointment, but this is our working segment. We've done a lot of conversation, diagnostic, co-discovery, and now we're going to get to business and we're going to take care of the pathogens that are present in this patient's mouth. And so things that happen during this segment of the appointment, I mentioned disclosing, there's biofilm removal or polishing, um, hard deposit removal, which can be mechanical and hand instrumentation, flossing, and then fluoride varnish. Although I have a little asterisk there because sometimes that falls into the final segment of the appointment because we, we often want to wait until the doctor has performed the exam. And if they haven't come in just yet, that might fall in later. So that one fluctuates into what aspect of that 2020, 20, it may fall. Uh, But strategies for efficiency during this, number one, one of the things that we see probably the most often, and I'll quote Kirk, he always says, are you um, giving away champagne, but charging for water? So how often are we providing services beyond the real diagnosis? So just making a proper diagnosis is going to help with our time management. What does health truly look like? as a hygiene team or as a hygienist, if you're a solo hygiene practitioner in your practice, just really define and document what health and maintenance looks like. And if there's something beyond that sitting in your chair, we might need to think about diagnosing and treatment planning and additional service. And maybe that's why this segment of our appointment is running long. Courtney, I know I have this come up with, with teams a lot in the world of coaching of, Uh, Yeah, but what do you do when you have that patient that's so overdue and you got to get them caught up? Or what do you do when they have all that buildup and you have to get them caught up? And so we talk about like, well, is that person healthy? Does that come up Mm -hmm. for you with teams too? It does. And I can hear Katrina's words in my mind where what you do in the chair is what is most important. So if you, if they need a debridement or if they need perio, but you know, that person just really wants to get their teeth cleaned or it's been so long, let me just do this first. And you do the profi, you're saying all the right things, but then you do the profi and you have them come back for the really important procedure that's going to treat their need. So it's, it's again, the conversation. I know that we want to keep going and we want to, we want to give the patient something, isn't the most important thing that we can give them the education and the tools to understand why the health of their mouth is so important and why we need to take a different course of action. 
And sometimes people will say, well, okay, well, what if I don't have time to start the periodontal therapy today, but I know they need periodontal therapy. Like I, I need to get that profit on. I need the production. We're going to be getting like four times the production next week and the week after when they're coming in for their periodontal mm -hmm. therapy. So like that's going to come. And the other thing to think about is when we're providing those periodontal services and we've built that value and the patients invested in their health, they're also going to be providing more restorative services for us long-term because they're bought into wanting to be healthier and have a better, better oral health outcome. So step number one is like, do away with the bloody prophies, right? Please, like we need to, <laughs> we please. need to look at what's actually happening in our patient's mouth, in our chair, define what's health and then make the appropriate diagnosis. Is a prophy appropriate? If not, is it gingivitis therapy that this patient really needs? And we know that now that's a code that for several years now we've been able to work into the mix when they're not actually periodontally involved with bone loss and attachment loss, but there's inflammation and 30% of the more, more of the mouth is showing bleeding points and signs of active infection of the gums. Periodontal therapy, periodontal maintenance, full mouth debridement. There's a lot of codes that we can use. And when we look at... Um, one of the first assessments you can do is like, let's run a report on how many of these codes we're running. And if our perio percentage is pretty low and we're mostly doing one, one, one O's in our practice, maybe there's something else going on there. And that's, what's holding us back on time. If it's taking more than this 20 minute segment for your therapeutic services, the question you would ask yourself is just, is there something more going on that I should be doing? And that is goes that back to the, you know, why the 2020 20 is so great. Cause it's framework. Mm -hmm. It's saying you should be able to gather all your diagnostic in 20. You should be able to do your therapeutic in 20. So if you're going over that 20, either there's too much chit chat or you're giving away services and you're misdiagnosing and there's, that's where the opportunity is. Absolutely. Very good point. So then we look at our workflow and another way to make things more efficient is through our workflow. So I would say consider bio biofilm removal first. So polishing first, I started, I was introduced to this concept actually really on it early on in my career, which I'm super grateful for. And the way I always explained it to patients was, um, sweeping before you mop. And if it was a gentleman who says, I don't mop, I'd say no problem. It's like washing your car before you wax it. <laughs> so, like, you know, what I, what I often get pushed back on with this is like, patients are used to having that at the end. No problem. But if we can explain the methodology and, and why so that we can remove the loose debris and get that out of the way so we can really focus on those hard deposits, the things that are really causing your infection, we're going to go ahead and do this first. It's just like sweeping before you mop. And if you've never tried it, I say just like give it a try. Try something new. It can be a total game changer. And if you are using disclosing, starting with your disclosing and OHI, hold up a mirror and let the patient decide for themselves what are some ways that I can make this better next time? Okay, now we're going to go in and remove that biofilm. And now we can focus on the hard deposits and all of that stuff's not in the way anymore. And so also the key, this gives us even more opportunity for the doctor to come on in. I've gotten all that plaque out of the way. Come on in. Mm -hmm. And now you can take a look. The other thing to think about is our mechanical instrumentation versus our hand instrumentation. And so most of us in the hygiene world know Ms. Esther Wilkins and years ago recommended the 80-20 rule of because research was starting to show us that mechanical instrumentation, instrumentation so your Cavitron, your Piazon, provides a more effective calculus removal and that water lavage biofilm disruption, it also results in more efficient workflow. And so if 80% of the time we're working with mechanical instrumentation and then 20% of the time hand instrumentation, we're going to have a more efficient therapeutic segment of our appointment. And so that brings us to the idea of we go around the whole mouth with that mechanical instrumentation and now we're selective hand scaling. And so basically you're taking your instrument and you, you so hygienists are saying, I can't not touch every tooth. Great, touch every tooth with an exploratory stroke. And then activate that working stroke if there's anything left behind. But gone are the days of needing to create this glassy surface around every single tooth with our hand instruments. So if we can provide that general hard deposit removal, calculus removal, biofilm disruption with our mechanical instrumentation for approximately 80% of the time that we're scaling, and then provide some selective hand scaling, this flow is going to result in a more efficient workflow during this therapeutic segment. I worked like this for years. Courtney, did you ever polish first? Not at first. So it was not introduced to me when I first started. So I was among the group that thought, that's weird. That's, I can't, I, but that's the way we've always done it. I can't switch. 
And it was a total game changer to remove all the soft everything first and really hone in on where you have to go. I, yeah. I love it. I understand the hesitation, but yes. also just do it. Just try, just do it on one patient. You're going to love it. You're gonna Because Courtney said so. Because I said so. <laughs> and because we hate the phrase, this is the way we've always done it. It's so true. It's so true. I actually, that's coming up. Look at that. <laughs> we've always done it. The w- seven most expensive words in dentistry, right, Kirk? Yep. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> Sometimes you have to try something new. The other piece of this is making sure that the instruments that you're using are effective. So making sure that you're checking your mechanical instrument instrumentation tips regularly. Well, um, we all with our Cavitron, we get those little cards that have all the the tips with the mm-hmm. angles. How often do we actually stop and use that? Now, I know you're gonna say, hygienist out there, like, yeah, but do you know how hard it is for me to get my doctor to buy me new Cavitron tips? Well, guess what? If you're running behind and creating production hiccups within the schedule on a regular basis, and all it takes is an extra Cavitron tip to help get that back on track. This is the conversations that you can have with your provider is making sure that those tips are assessed regularly and that we're getting the most out of their working action, sharpening our hand instruments. We do have to take the time. We have to carve it intentionally carve (laughs) as we sharpen our instruments (laughs) to make sure that we're doing that. Otherwise we are going to be less effective and our therapeutic segment will take more time. And then again, if there's any maintenance or calibration, a lot of people using airflow, systems now there there's a lot of maintenance in order for those things to function properly so just having a consistent rhythm with making sure that we're taking care of our equipment and then like courtney said and i fully agree with don't settle into just that's the way we've always done it um i remember challenging a client and saying like but why do you do that and then she would answer and i said but why do you do that and then she would answer but why do you do that well because that's how i was trained to do it and i'm like and when did you graduate <laughs> So I graduated 20 years ago in 2003. If I was doing things, I mean, I'm not practicing chair side anymore, but when I was, if I was doing things the same way as when I was in school, things change in 20 years, things change in 10 years, things change in five years. I I like to always relate it to this. Think about having kids. For those of you who have kids, if you have a 10 year old and then you have a baby, that's like a whole new experience of having a baby. Things change a lot in terms of what foods we're supposed to introduce and what products are appropriate and what vaccination schedules in place now. So when we think about how much things change and how resistant we are in the dental community, we got to sometimes switch and relate it to things that we're more familiar with to say like, maybe I do just need to try something new. All right. So that takes us into the last segment of the appointment. Uh, that last 20 minutes, which is our logistics segment. So this is the segment where the logistics are completed. We want to ensure that the appointment is concluded properly. We want to summarize and create clarity with our patient. We also want to make sure that the tangibles are done within our practice management software and all of the communication amongst the team members is done well. So this typically involves the doctor exam. Now, I don't have an asterisk here, but asterisk, we did mention this might have happened in that middle 20 minutes, if your doctor came in and interrupted, cause you let them know that you were all set with diagnostics. And so we just share that five minutes of the exam back with the, other, with the other segment of time, mm-hmm. but typically it's going to fall within this last 20 minutes. That's also when we wrap up and summarize our OHI, we answer patient questions about the doctor exam or things that we've brought up throughout the appointment. We do a wrap up. We just do a summation. One of my favorite questions is what is your understanding about what we're doing next time you come in and making sure that they heard everything that you talked about throughout that appointment. We schedule their next visit. We may or may not provide them an appointment card. We ask them what what their preferences are. We also want this last 20 minutes to include our chart documentation and our room turnover. And this is where all the eyebrows virtually just went up. Because typically we're walking our patient out at 55 after the hour Mm -hmm. and walking back into our op at 58 after the hour and we have two minutes. So no. So I just challenge you to think in a 60 minute appointment, really it's about 50 minutes, 52 minutes of patient engagement. And that last section of time, which is somewhere between five and 10 minutes is really the patient's no longer in our chair 
and they've been escorted out. And we are now doing our chart documentation and we're turning our room over. And we do have to look at our, I know Amanda's on, our infection control protocols. What are we using to disinfect our room? What's the sitting time that that's supposed to be there before we bring our next patient back? And we do have to give ourselves an appropriate amount of time to do that. A lot of times what ends up happening is we sit through our whole lunch break doing chart notes. And then we sit for 35 minutes at the end of the day doing chart notes, Mm -hmm. right? And our chart notes have to get done that day. Legally, we should have them done within the same day of treatment. And honestly, our brains by the next day, we're already into the next working day. And now it's next day's lunch before we're doing the chart notes from yesterday. And we forget things and we're not going to be as clear in our documentation. So I challenge you to think of this 60 minute time is about, again, 50 to 52 minutes of patient care. And that's going to more often get you walking out the door by at least 52 after and headed up front. So you have time to do your chart notes in your room turnover. So I've done this, so I know it can work. So I'm just going to throw that out there. So systems are the key though. If we don't systemize things, then this last 20 minutes can get crazy out of hand. And then we're like, just like rushing, rushing, rushing like crazy. So handoffs are really important. When that doctor comes in for the exam, having a systemized, agreed upon way in which we transfer information to the doctor. Courtney and I, in preparation for this webinar, we're talking about our own experiences as well as some of our teams. Some of our doctors are really, really great at the relationship building, which means they spend 10 minutes talking to the patient and catching up before we even get into what we saw on the x-rays or saw in the patient's mouth, right, Courtney? And that is not efficient. That is not efficient. <laughs> so if so we if can you, design, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so if, if you and your doctor are aligned on what information we need to share, let me go first. Let me drive the conversation, including the patient, right? It's a three-way conversation. Then you can come in, not to say don't come in and say hello and, you know, shake hands, but throw it back to me quickly yeah. so that I can give my information. Absolutely. And again, the intentionality behind this being a documented and agreed upon system, not just like, well, I'll try it. No, you have to talk to your doctor first. You guys agree that you're going to do this. Sometimes you even have to practice it Mm -hmm. outside of patient care time to make it really efficient. And Kirk raised his hand again. Uh, Yes. I just was waiting for an opportunity to add some value here, but shout out to Ashley Mitchell, who said, I love having my templates and prompts in notes so I can be clicking throughout the appointment. And the meat of my note is done by the end, by the time I walk them out. Yes. Awesome job, Ashley. That is super well done. Awesome. Yep. Taking advantage of your software and making those templates work for you. That's so smart. Good job. Yay. See, it, it can work. You can also build out multi-codes talking about our software, like explosion codes. So if you're having to put in the treatment planning, if a crown's recommended, and that's an expectation of you, the hygienist, to enter that in, the more things that you can have built out into multi-codes and explosion codes can be really helpful. Auto templates for chart documentation, as Ashley just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then also having a handoff system or a pit stop for our admin team so that when we're walking out, we're sharing with them what procedures did we complete today and what are we scheduling next? What's the investment, the financial investment for the procedure? The patient's going to want to know what that's all about and also how much time is needed. So we want to make sure we stop at the front and have a very systemized handoff as well, just like we do with our doctor. This isn't just for the efficiency of the office. It's also for the patient to be able to hear repetitively. What did we do today? What value did it add? What are we doing next time? How's that going to help them meet their goals? What are their objections? Are they concerned about time? Are they concerned about cost? And now your admin team is set up for success to be able to take that patient off your hands and give you the opportunity to head back into your room and take care of business. And hopefully they're not going to have to come back and say, hey, did you end up doing fluoride today? Hey, you mentioned a crown. When did the doctor want to do that? Because it's all shared in that transfer of information that we strategically post when we do that handoff at the front office. So important to do. There's a few other systems. We don't have time for these systems today, but just things to think about looking at hygiene reappointment and what uh, systemizing how we ask patients to schedule ahead for their next visit and build that into the appointment, the treatment planning process, 
who does what and really systemizing what our role during that logistics segment would be in the treatment planning process. We talked about huddle earlier, um, even your exam and systemizing the exam to help, especially if a doctor needs that additional, um, like you mentioned earlier, framework for how does this exam flow to make things as efficient as possible. Sterilization systems, who's helping when so that we have things ready and equipment prepared on time our operatory setups and maintenance. There's a lot of things within the practice that we can systemize that feed into making each of these three segments of our appointment function more smoothly. And if you do find that you're unsure that you're following this 2020 well, or I do run behind pretty often, or you know what? I don't have time to do my chart notes and turn my room over on a regular basis. I would just encourage you to do a time analysis. Actually, a really simple not super structured, but easy way to do it tomorrow if you wanted to is just have a post-it note for each of your appointments. And it says 202020. And you stop at the end of the diagnostics and make a check mark if you were done within 20 minutes and write down the time if you weren't. And then that second 20 minutes, okay, was I done with my hygiene um, hygiene therapy sex segment by 40 minutes after the hour? Check if you did it and write down the time if you didn't. Same thing with the last part. And then do that for one day and just look at your post-it notes. That's a super non-scientific and easy way to just jump into trying a little bit of this and seeing where do I maybe miss the mark throughout my appointment. And then you can come back and watch the replay and you can say, you know what? It's always during my diagnostic segment. What types of strategies do Courtney and Miranda say could be helpful to make that more efficient? Now, there is a more in-depth version of time analysis. We do this with all of our coaching clients. And so um, really stopping and looking at like, when did we seat the patient? When did we start this? When did we stop that? How long did the exam take? How long did this take? Like you can get really, really detailed with a time analysis. Um, We could do a whole nother webinar on that. But for (laughs) now, you can just start with a super simple post-it notes, 2020, like how am I doing with these three segments of time? And be honest because the goal is to, to improve and to learn and become more efficient. So be honest with yourself so so you can do those things. You know what? When you just said that, that's so smart. And it made me think immediately. A lot of times we put the pressure on ourselves that like I failed in some way if I didn't hit the mark. No, Mm -hmm. you have systems that either aren't established or need to be revised or the system itself is just failing you right now. It's not you. It's always comes down to the systems. So be honest with yourself because then you're not going to look at your own self and say, what am I doing wrong? No, 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 no. What systems could we do differently? What technology could we incorporate? It's not about you. You're doing the best you can. I know that. It's how can we systemize things to make Mm -hmm. things more efficient? Yep. So I know we're approaching the end. So a few final takeaways, perform a time analysis, determine which segments might offer the most opportunity for improvement for you. Try new things. Don't let the way that you've always done it hold you back from from trying something new. And maybe you just try, you know what, my last two appointments of the day on Tuesday, I'm going to try that new workflow and I'm going to polish first. And I'm going to leave my hand scaler sitting there until I'm done with 80% of my instrumentation mechanically and just see what happens and how you feel about that flow. Just try something new. And just remember that systems are the key to success. When your timing is off, it's time to evaluate your systems. This is what I was just mentioning before. It's not about you as a human being or a hygienist. It's about these systems and how can we make them work for us and help our technology to work for us to make things flow a little bit smoother. So I feel pretty good there. 301. 301. <laughs> Kirk, do we have questions? Uh, no, we, we added all the questions that came into the feed. So please add any questions that you have right now. We want to help you. Uh, one of the questions came up. Is there going to be a recording available? Yes, you'll get it tomorrow. Send it to everybody. We want to help. And um, while we're waiting to see if any other questions come in, just as a heads up, our next webinar, which is going to be on February 15th, is PPO independence. And do you take my insurance? And how do you turn that question that causes so much anxiety into a winning conversation? We're going to give you some tips and tricks on managing the do you take my insurance question. Kirk is raising his hand again. Yeah, oh, there was one question. I love question. Where, or comment. I love the dynamic of the hygiene appointment to make it more profitable for the office. However, do do all these hygienists and new graduates that are asking for astronomical high pays today? How can you be uh, an office that's profitable if now 
days when hiring a new hygienist, they want to produce three to four times their salary, but that's a big one. And yeah. they want work-life balance, which is a good thing and not working a lot. Well, okay. So that's, so, there's a so lot of I, questions. There's a lot in of there. stuff loaded into that. However, I will speak to this one. You should watch our webinar next time on PPO independence. And, and the question of, do you take my insurance? Because one way to be able to pay your hygienist, these like astronomical fees, although I I'm with you, it's getting, people are being held a little hostage. There's a fine line. We have to walk between where our value is as hygienists and being very proud and confident in who we are and also the profitability of the practice. And when you, when you are participating with a lot of insurance companies, and again, we don't like to get on the platform of like, that's what we're always preaching, but like you do have to write off a significant amount of what you're producing. And so when a hygienist is working this hard, like, let's go back to that list of everything that's happening during yep. that 60 minute visit. And then we're writing off half of it. It is going to be hard to pay your hygienist top-notch fees, but if you, there's not a dentist out there that doesn't want an exceptional hygienist sitting chair side. And so we do also have to make sure that we're valuing our hygienists and learning what it is that makes them feel valued. Is it the dollar amount? Is it extra vacation days? Is it uh, work-life balance? Is it being able to customize my hours? We have to work together to bridge this gap somewhere. Cause man, that question, that's a loaded one. There's, and we could go really, really far with it. There's a lot within that question. Kirk has his hand up again. There's one more. There's a couple in here. Um, this one, how do you manage those patients that take the full 60 minutes for therapy diagnostic without even the exam accounted for? So I would go back to some of what we said before, which is are we being as efficient with our diagnostic time as possible? So I'd for, you need to do that time analysis, right? Of like which aspect, the diagnostic or the therapeutic is running long that's pushing us so deep into the logistic piece. And so let's look at our efficiencies within the diagnostic or therapeutic segment. And once you know which segment is running long, now you can go back and tackle, Again, we talked about a framework. We can't fix the whole appointment, but if we know which piece of the appointment we can be more efficient within, we can implement some of these strategies to systemize things and try to help that appointment flow a little bit smoother. Yeah. One more from mm -hmm. Hadley Thurman. Shout out to Hadley. Hey, Hadley. Uh, oh, wait. Um, is, uh, Bert, did you have a thought? I thought I thought I heard a voice. I'm hearing voices. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Hadley said, thank you. This has been really great. We do uh, many of these things, but we always pick up so many valuable ideas and tips from you. Do you have any recommendations for software to record probings? That is a great question. And I'm always really great at acknowledging when things are not my area of expertise. So the only one I truly know of is Florida Probe. I think it's probably mm -hmm. the most well-known within the industry of hygiene. And so Courtney, do you know anything outside of that? No, Florida Probe was what came to mind also. Yeah. Um, Google probably knows. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I had more for you on that, but I'm really good at knowing. Like, I don't know. The other thing we can do, though, is we can reach out. That was Hadley that asked that question, correct? We can reach out to our other coaches and see if any of their teams are working with a voice recorded system. And sure. I'm sure, Hadley, we could reach out and let you know what we find out. For sure. And if you're listening to the webinar and you happen to have one, please add it to the chat. Yeah. I'll share it. So. Cool. cool. And that, that kind of summarizes all the questions that awesome. we have. Great job. Yeah. That this was, was awesome. so fun. Was to fun. Sit and talk hygiene. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. Love it. Now, well, not, not that it might like, I'm, I'm super worried about this cause I am still sweating. Like, how did I do it? Was it okay? Like I did, <laughs> did I do okay? You were oh awesome, gosh. Kirk. I really love the hand, putting your hand up. That do you like perfect. the hand thing? That's love it. Put that up, you know, <laughs> and it, you put the it, CE in the chat. Good mm -hmm. job. Thank you to Angela. So anybody oh. who's on the CE is in the chat. Okay, wait. Denise added this. Voice Pro is who we use in our office. So thank you, Denise. Thank you. Yeah. See, it this is full circle. This takes us all the way back to the beginning of the webinar when we talked about how amazing our community is and how much we learn when we get together with our community at ACT. Because we just it. learned about a new voice system, Voice Pro. Thanks, Denise. Yeah, thank you. And we're CE geeks. We could keep you on here for three more hours. What do you guys want to talk about? Bola AI. <laughs> Lisa says Bola AI is working wonderfully oh, yeah. for us. Oh, yep. that's great. Hi, Janice. Love it. It's awesome. Okay.
Awesome. Well, thanks so much for everybody who took the time out of being here. We appreciate it. I know how hard it is to find time in your workday since that's what we were talking about today. And Courtney, you were awesome. Kirk, great admin job today. So Miranda, you're the best. You're the best, Miranda. (laughs) Thanks. Well, you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Have a great day, everybody. 